Well, hello and welcome, true crime fans. Yes, hello. <laughs> Glad to have you with us today. Uh, my name's Taylor Vido, and I'm joined by... Jen York. Before we get into it, uh, we want to thank you first off for listening to this podcast. It's our first foray into podcasting, so we appreciate your support. Uh, quick little background on both of us. We're both journalists located in Spokane, Washington at the CBS affiliate. I've been here since 2013, and Jen, you've been here since 2010. Yeah, and I'm a lifelong Washington resident, as are you. You focus, though, on our North Idaho area, the little sliver of Idaho closest to Spokane. That's that's true. A lot more to Idaho, of course, a big state, and uh, it's a story from a different part of the state that we're going to be talking about on this podcast. Yeah, well, we're lifelong Pacific Northwest natives. Of course, our area, no stranger to crimes. I'm sure many of you know a few of our most famous cases. Of course, we have the Green River Killer. Joseph Duncan. That was another big one, one we've uh, been hearing about on podcasts uh, lately as well. Uh, Ted Bundy. Yes, that's it. (laughs) So I was like, why was that not coming to mind just right right there? (laughs) Who can forget him? Yeah, I know a, a lot of true crime fans know our little corner of the country is... Uh, for ripe, better or for worse. Yeah, <laughs> ripe with stories when it comes to uh, that topic. And and today we're definitely going to dive into one of our latest cases that's gripping attention all around the world. Yeah, no kidding. So this is a story that originates from a rural Idaho town. And as I mentioned, it's gripping the nation. Now, at the surface level, it centers around newlyweds appearing to enjoy their new life together but it quickly falls apart with a mystery surrounding the disappearance of two children and a string of suspicious deaths and possible links to doomsday. Now, there was no sign of life from the kids, but also no sign of death. And the couple? Well, they aren't talking. But as investigators would later learn, it's a case that speaks volumes without ever saying a word. This is One Foot in the Grave. All right, Taylor, you ready to get into this? I am. Okay, but uh, let's let's set some background here. So tell me about the main players in this story, Jen. Well, let's start with Lori Vallow. This is where it all starts. So Lori Vallow was born June 26th, 1973. Now, decades before she was making headlines, Lori appeared to live a bit of a uh, colorful life. Now, she grew up as part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and she was fairly involved She was a cheerleader in high school, though, and later a beauty pageant contestant. That's back in 2004. She was mom then, so I think that's pretty neat. Yeah, double duty. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, she's busy. So uh, I've seen a snippet of this pageant, of the Mrs. Texas pageant, and what I've seen, she competes in a ball gown round and in a bikini round, and the announcer in the video introduces her as Lori Ryan, the name of a former spouse. Now, according to Oxygen, she actually finished in the top 15. Hey, there you go. Yeah, and also something to note, the announcer in the video also talks about Lori's recent win on Wheel of Fortune, where she brought home $17,000. So we haven't even gotten into the nuts and bolts of this story and why she's famous now, but it sounds like prior to this, she wasn't a stranger to the limelight. Right. Yeah, clearly she can handle herself in front of a crowd. So she has three children biological son Colby he's the oldest biological daughter Tylee Ryan she was 16 she had her GED and she wanted to become a police officer Vallow also has an adopted son JJ who's seven teachers described him as a fun boy who just loved everyone so surface level seems pretty normal Mm -hmm. minus I mean she's doing a lot of things in front of crowds maybe she's just not shy some people are outgoing yes All right, but not everything is peachy with Vallo when we, you know, go behind the scenes here. She has a few failed marriages under her belt. She's been married five times, and at least two of her ex-husbands are dead. Now, according to East Idaho News, she married her first husband in 1992, and they have no children. Now, some reports say this was her high school sweetheart. Now, she married her second husband in 1995. He is the father of her firstborn son, Colby. We mentioned him. 
She also marries her third husband, Joseph, in 2001. That's Tylee's father. Now, tragically, he died in 2018 of an apparent heart attack. Her fourth husband is Charles Vallow, JJ's adoptive dad. Now, JJ is a distant relative to Charles. He is his sister's grandson. Now, JJ is living with some challenges. Doctors diagnosed him with autism, and he requires the help of a service dog. Now, in 2017, friends say a rift forms between Charles and Lori, and she becomes distant. And during that time, she starts reading some new books by author Chad Daybell. He's a novelist and a podcaster about doomsday and people preparing for the end of the world. And over time, friends say Lori becomes more and more obsessed with these extreme beliefs, venturing well beyond the LDS doctrine. Now, about two years later, in January 2019, a friend says she begins to act strangely, saying she believes she has superpowers and has lived many times on this earth. Now, she told this same friend Charles, her husband, was already dead and a demon was living inside him. A sentiment reiterated by Charles himself in body camera video released by Gilbert, Arizona Police. It actually shows him calling police for help twice. For a mental health petition he filed against Lori. Take a listen. I've tried to support her as much as I could, but it's gotten really, really bad lately. She's had a break. She says, I'm Nick Schneider. I've taken over Charles's body, and Charles has been killed. I'm going to kill you. You're going to be murdered today or tomorrow. So, Taylor, what can you tell me about that video? So, it's, it looks like it's middle of the day. It's daylight. Charles is outside a hotel. And when he's talking with police, he he seems somewhat calm, all things considered, but also slightly on edge. I know that sounds a little weird, but kind of like a mix. Like his thoughts are all very well put together and he's speaking coherently, but speaking a little bit fast, as you heard there. And, you know, it sounds like this is something he's gone through his mind several times before. It's like, you know, for lack of a better way to describe it, he sounds kind of convincing with what he's describing. Yeah, and it sounds like he's... Um... Maybe just at his wits end, like someone who has no place else to turn. He doesn't know what to do. And another thing I noticed, too, is as he's talking with police, it looks like he's making eye contact with the couple officers that he's there talking with. But as he's also doing that, he'll be looking off in the distance behind them, you know, almost kind of like maybe, you know, that's the way some of us are. Our eyes will wander. But it also kind of seems like to me that it's like he's looking over their shoulders, wondering like something might be coming after him or someone might be coming after him. Yeah, he's definitely like surveilling the scene. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. So he goes on to tell police that Lori threatened to murder him and then again, another man was inhibiting his body. He even calls her unhinged. Now records show Lori did give police her side of the story claiming that she wanted Charles out of their home because she allegedly caught him cheating. And she did take a mental health evaluation stemming from this, but was later released. Now, the next month, this is February 2019, Charles files for divorce from his wife of 13 years, saying he was worried about his life, JJ and Tylee. And in the divorce filing, he also says Lori claimed she was working to carry out Christ's second coming and that if he got in her way, she would murder him. And then... We get to just a few months later. We get to July 11th, 2019, about 7.45 in the morning, to an event that Charles so desperately tried to avoid. Krem's News to Know email newsletter helps you get ready for the day ahead by giving you a quick look at the stories you need to know delivered to your inbox. Subscribe now at krem.com. Okay, so it's Thursday, July 11th, and the day's just getting started. Police in Arizona say Charles went to Lori's rental home to take JJ to summer school. Now, this is also where Lori's brother, Alex Cox, is living. But this is no routine school day. Less than an hour later, police say Charles is dead, and Lori's brother, Alex Cox, shot and killed him in what he says is self-defense. Okay, so he told police Vallow attacked him with a baseball bat. 
Cox says it all started when Charles and Lori got into a fight. He says Tylee, the daughter, then appeared with a bat to defend Lori, and Charles took the bat, and then came at Cox and hit him in the back of the head. Alex says he went to go get a gun from his room, and while this is going on, Tylee and Lori went outside where JJ was already waiting in the car. Cox told police he had returned from his room and shot Charles twice in the chest, killing him. Now, police say Tylee, Lori, and JJ didn't witness the shooting. Again, they were outside. They say Lori and Tylee went to drive JJ to school. They continued on with that. When Lori and Tylee return home, police are at the scene, and they're stringing up crime scene tape. Now, uh, we want to play you a little bit of body camera footage from the scene. Take a listen. Does your husband live here or no? No, this is his Gotcha. We just moved in here. Gotcha. How long have you lived here? Like three weeks. Oh, geez. Yeah, okay. That's why the neighbors don't know us. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> like, hi, neighbor, sorry. And keep in mind, this, what you just heard there, that's not very long after Charles Vallow was shot and killed. Yeah, again, her husband of more than a decade. Uh, what's jarring to me in this police body camera footage is that Lori appears to be nonchalant. Now, people grieve differently. I, we understand that. But in this video, there don't appear to be any outward signs of shock or grief. And at one point, Lori even makes a comment about how the neighbors don't know her and it's really embarrassing to be causing such commotion. She she doesn't appear to be upset that her brother just shot and killed Charles in her home. And neighbors add that later that day, Lori even threw a, a pool party at the house. And again, to your point of everyone grieving differently, this just seems a little strange when something like this happen something very significant and it's the adoptive father of one of your kids at least you would maybe be handling things a little differently not having a pool party literally just feet from where a fatal shooting occurred right yeah it's just it it's odd we can just say that and again i'm not a parent so i don't know what i would do in that situation people grieve differently but the kids are there too you know, I don't. I would like to think some parents would maybe want to shield the kids from this active crime scene. Someone that they knew and loved, helped raise them, Agreed. shot and killed. Uh, there might be a different reaction there, but that's not the case for Lori. Well, less than two months later after this incident, we're in the beginning of September, Lori Appa moves the kids to Rexburg, Idaho. That same hometown of the author and podcaster she followed, Chad Daybell. Alex? moves with the family too he actually moves into the same apartment complex and it's here in this small rural idaho town where a mystery unfolds and one by one people begin to disappear i'm mark hanrahan in my creme 2 verify reports i take your questions and investigate if they're true or false if you get the coronavirus and you get over it can you get it a second time the short answer is yes they can so we can verify it is possible to get COVID-19 twice, but at this point, experts say the evidence suggests it's rare. Do you have information you want me to verify? Verify only on CREM2 News. It's just a few days after arriving in Rexburg on September 8th that Tylee is seen for the last time. Investigators are able to pin down her last known location at Yellowstone National Park, seen in a picture there with JJ and her uncle Alex. 14 days later, two weeks later here, JJ is seen for the last time at school. In that same two-week span between when Tylee was last seen and JJ disappears, trainers say Lori gave away JJ's service dog, which helps him with his stress related to autism. And the next day, Lori calls J.J. school and tells them he's going to be homeschooled. I would call that a red flag <laughs> right there. These service animals are not something you just get overnight. They are trained for your specific needs, and it helps you with your day-to-day -day functioning. Without that service animal, I would imagine J.J. would have a really tough time. And so why give it away? You know, that's what I wonder. Yeah, yeah, and it, I mean, it takes time to train these animals again. So, uh, and it's something that made his life so much easier 
I think as a parent, you want probably the best for your kids. It just is, again, another red flag, maybe a, a, just something that seems odd. Yeah. So within the next six weeks, Lori rents a storage unit in Rexburg, and she's seen on video visiting it several times. Now, police would later gain access to the unit and find multiple items belonging to the kids, but still no sign of the children. Then in the first week of November, this is mere weeks after the disappearance of her two kids and a few months following the murder of her estranged husband, she says, I do, on a beach in Hawaii. Her new husband though, the doomsday author, friends say she was infatuated with Chad Daybell. Now they appear to be happy newlyweds. They spend some time in Hawaii before returning to Idaho, but before too long, they find themselves back on the islands after an unexpected visit from police. And while possibly trying to fly under the radar, what they did not know was that police were watching their every move. Additional sources for One Foot in the Grave includes Creme 2 News, 48 Hours, CBS News, and music by Jason Gray.